Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed be a sin. Good evening. For a minute there, I thought Andy was going to try to preach my sermon. I'd hate to have to run up here and knock him off the stage. Or we could do tag team, either way. Welcome to our Friday night program here at the 35th annual Philip Street Lectureship. It is an honor and a privilege for me to stand before you and talk about Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior. On Wednesday night, Brother Winkler talked about Jesus' heart and how he was the greatest servant that ever walked this earth. Last night, Brother Colley spoke to us about that old rugged cross where the dearest and best was crucified for you and me. Tonight, I want to take another step. And I want to talk about the greatest leader who ever lived. And I don't know about you, but I want to model my life after not second best, but first best, or the best. And there, he is the only one. It was Peter in Acts chapter 2 and verse 36 with the other apostles who lifted up his voice at the end of the sermon, after which about 3,000 souls were added to the body of Christ. Where in verse 36, he said, Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and and Christ. Now think about that. He is Lord. That means we worship Him. He comes first. This is His house. He makes the rules. He is master. He is leader. We're His followers. We're His servants. We're His people. We are His students. We sit at His feet. We follow Him. David wrote about Jesus in Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, he said, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David is speaking about Christ as the shepherd. That's who he follows. You and I, we never have to worry about or be concerned about Jesus' qualifications, his abilities, his intentions when it comes to leadership. He will lead. The trouble with us and with it, our society, and it's always been this way, the trouble is not in Jesus' leadership, but in our fellowship. Now, it is true. One of the things that made Jesus the greatest leader on earth and in the universe is the fact that he was also the greatest follower. Now, when you, when you think about that, if you want to... If you want to be a follower of Jesus and follow Him securely and 
heartfeltedly look into the cross in your life, if you're going to follow Him, then that's going to make you greater and greater the closer you get to Him. Because the greatest follower is who becomes the greatest leader. When you, when you measure all the qualifications of an elder, uh, and an elder of the church is that one whom, whom the Holy Spirit has placed over the church to oversee it and tend it as an eldership or within the eldership. That man's qualifications, if you just, if you just take all of them and bundle them together and look at them, you'll find the greatest servant. And so God takes the greatest servant, the Holy Spirit takes the greatest servant and exalts him into the position of the, being the greatest leader. You see, you and I, it's our job to follow. We don't have to worry about Jesus doing his job. He'll do it. But what about you? And what about me? I want to look at Jesus' leadership and and try to narrow it down. And like Brother Colley said, how in the world can you ever preach about the old rugged cross in 30 minutes? How can you ever get across to the audience, to humanity, the heart of Jesus in just a few minutes? The same is true with his leadership. How can we ever, with human words, say what it is and how it is? But I'm going to try to do that in three points. Doesn't a preacher supposed to have, you know, uh, an introduction, three points, and a conclusion? Well, I'm going to try, Andy, to follow that, that rule that you've set, I think. I want to look at... Jesus being the greatest leader because he was molded by faith. Then I want to look at Jesus being the greatest leader because he was motivated by the hope of heaven. Then I want to look at Jesus as being the greatest leader because he was moved by the love of God, his Father, and the love for every one of us And indeed, the whole of the human race. Jesus was molded by faith. Now we know how faith comes. In Romans chapter 10 verse 17, the scriptures tell us plainly, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. We know that Jesus was molded by faith because all you have to do is look at Luke chapter 1, Luke chapter 2, on into chapter 3. And you can see that the angel came to his mother, Mary, visited her and explained to her what was about to happen to her. That she was going to be with child of the Holy Spirit of God. That that child was going to, that she's going to bring forth would be the Son of God. The Savior of the world would be great and His name would be Jesus and He would save His people from their sins. After Jesus was born, wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger, visited by the Magi, eight days later, He was, as the custom was according to the law of Moses, taken to the temple and dedicated to God and circumcised. We find on just a few verses when Jesus was 12 years old. The Bible tells us that Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem as was their custom every year for the Passover. If you put all of this together in Luke chapter 2 and verse 52, the Bible tells us Jesus increased. He grew in wisdom, in stature, in favor with God and in favor with man. He grew to be a leader. He was a leader and he grew to be a leader. Why? Because he was molded by faith. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, the writer to the Hebrews tells us about faith. How can anyone please God without faith? And he tells us there, it is impossible to please God. 
For those of us who come to God must believe that He is and that He is the rewarder of those or them who diligently seek Him. Christ was molded by faith. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1, we find out a description, if you will, or maybe a definition of faith. How that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That leads us to my next point. Jesus was the greatest leader who ever lived because of the hope that he had. And that hope, the hope of heaven, is what motivated him in his life to be the greatest leader. Think about the hope of heaven that you have. We've sung about it Wednesday night and last night and even tonight. It's the hope that we all have if you're a Christian. The hope that we have after this life is over. Think about Jesus, if you will, in the wilderness. After his baptism, about age 30, he went off 40 days in the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And yet during that time of of fasting and prayer and dedicating himself to God, always in view of the hope that he had, motivated by that hope to last that 40 days, and then being tempted by the devil in every way with the, the lust of the eye and with the lust of the flesh and with the pride of life. Jesus conquered over those temptations. Why? Because he was molded by faith. That's why he was able to succeed. That's why he was, he, it, what makes him to be the leader that we all can follow because he's going to lead us where? To his hope. Where's his hope? In heaven. He was molded by faith. But he was motivated by hope. Think about, if you will, Hebrews 11 verse 1. Where faith is the substance of hope. No wonder we live in a society where many are hopeless. At least they feel hopeless, and maybe they are hopeless. But how can any of us have hope without faith? How can you have something when the very substance of that something is lacking? So faith is the foundation for our salvation. In Ephesians chapter 2, in verse 8 and 9, we know that we are saved by grace through faith. How beautiful that faith is. That faith molded Jesus, and that faith led him to the wilderness. It motivated him to withstand those temptations. And during it all, he never gave in. Think about Jesus in the garden. Just a few months later, in the Garden of Gethsemane, with his disciples, them asleep, and him in prayer. Three times he came to his disciples and said, Wake up! Could you not watch with me for one hour? Where he bled those sweat drops of blood. Where he gave himself to God. Where he uttered those words, Nevertheless, not my will be done, but your will be done. Let this cup pass from me. What was it that motivated him to do what he had to do? Well, it was his hope. The hope that he had to go home. What drives you? What drives me? When we look in, and we're becoming more like Jesus day by day as a Christian... What is it that motivates us to get up in the morning and live the Christian life? What motivates us when death is all around us to keep living? What motivates us when there's sickness around us to, to take care of ourselves and take one more step? What motivates us to live the Christian life when the people around us seem like have more of the world stuff than we do? They seem like sometimes they're getting along better than we are. What motivates us? Well, we have something they don't have. We have something that Jesus had. We have hope in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He is our shepherd. He is our master. He is our leader. 
He is our Lord. He is our Savior. We follow Him. Think about Jesus on the cross. That old rugged cross. So despised by the world. It has a wondrous attraction to me. Why? Because on that old cross, the dear Lamb of God was hung there, sacrificed to sanctify you and me and anyone who comes to Him with trusting faith, obedient faith. Yes, Jesus was molded by faith. He was motivated by hope. He never gave in. He never gave out. And on the cross, He never gave up. Now you might think He did because He said the words before He breathed His last, it is finished. But that didn't mean He was giving up on anything. It meant that He would, had finished the work that His Father had given Him to do. In the words of my three-year-old granddaughter, she says to me, I done. And when she's finished with something, that's the way it is. And I can see Jesus, my Lord, on the cross, finally, finally, getting to go home to see the hope that He had matured and realized. And brothers and sisters, if you're a Christian tonight, you'll realize it, we will, one day. We must continue in our faith to let God mold us and make us into the image of His Son, to become like Him. We need to continue to remind ourselves to be motivated not by worldly things, not by fleshly things, and oh, does that tempt us, but by spiritual things, by godly things, by the hope of heaven. Thirdly, not only is Jesus, was Jesus the greatest leader who ever lived because He was molded by faith and motivated by hope, but He was moved by love. The love of His Father. The love of you and me to see us have what He has. To see us forgiven. To see our sins washed away. Indeed, it is true, that verse that we all quote from John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. In verse 17, it's a verse we often forget. We find that God didn't send His Son into the world to condemn it, but that the world might be saved through Him, through His life, and through His sacrifice. In John chapter 6 and verse 38, the Bible tells us about Jesus and the service that He gave to His Father, molded by faith, motivated by hope, and moved by love, where He saw and heard His Father all the time I come not to do my own will, but the will of Him who sent me. The words that I speak, they're not mine, but they're the words of my Father. The cup that I, the, the cup that I must drink, there's no other person, there's no other being to drink it except me. I'm the only one that can save you, to, can, that can save humanity. He said, I came not to do my own will, but I came to do my Father's will. How can you tell how, what, what someone puts as first? You can tell when you look at your checkbook, can't you? You can tell when you talk to an individual what they're interested in. You get Andy and I together, 
We might talk a little uh, sports and a little other things, but you can rest assured he and I are talking about the Lord Jesus Christ and his church. Because that's the most important thing to us. We take Matthew chapter 6 verse 33 seriously. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things will be added unto you. We, we're serious about that. I remember Cindy and I standing in line one time at a restaurant. And the line was quite long and we had a great conversation with the people that were in front of us. And we didn't know them, they didn't know us. And we were talking and, and, and everything was fine until the, the man asked me what I did for the living. Uh, Sir, what do you do for a living? And I said, well, uh, I'm a gospel preacher. And he and his wife turned around, faced the other way, and that was the last word he said to me. You can tell what a person's, where a person's heart is, what they're molded by, what they're motivated by, and what moves them. All you got to do is talk to them for a few minutes. You'll find what they're interested in. When you look at a person's relationship, who their friends are, you can tell who's first. Are their friends, are their closest friends worldly friends or Christian friends? You can tell what moves a person. Look at a person's calendar. You can tell what comes first. You can tell what, by, uh, what a person's passionate about what comes first. If we're going to become more like Jesus, we need to recognize Him as Lord and Savior. We need to recognize Him as the leader that He is. He was moved by love. What moves us? If Jesus was moved by love and I'm following Him, shouldn't I be moved by love? If Jesus was molded by faith and I'm following Him because He's the leader... Shouldn't I too be molded by faith? If Jesus was motivated by the hope of heaven, what is it that should motivate me or you as a Christian? In Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, the scriptures tell us what Jesus was all about coming to seek and to save the lost. He's declaring, this is my mission. I was molded by faith. I'm motivated by the hope of heaven to, to go home and to take as many with me as I can. And what moves me, what moved the Apostle Paul, what moved all of the apostles, what moved the writers of the New Testament, what moved your daddy and mother, maybe, and mine to, to train me in the ways of righteousness and the ways of God was love. I long for my children. And Cindy and I have two, a daughter and son. My greatest goal for them is that they might go to heaven. I want that to move them. I want it to motivate them. And I want it to mold their thinking and their lives and their choices. In John chapter 14, verse 1 through 6, Jesus is about to leave and realize his hope. And he says to his disciples, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. Where I, whither I go, you know, and the way you know. Of course, the disciples, they didn't understand. And then Jesus said in verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Jesus is a leader. Are we following? Let's look at it this way. If I'm at your house, who has the authority? You. 
If you're at my house, who has the leadership or the authority? Me. If we're in God's house, who has the authority? Who has the authority to say how we worship? Who has the authority to say what pleases Him in whether we sing a cappella? in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in our heart, or whether we have instruments of music. Who makes those rules? Who's the leader? If this is the Lord's church, and indeed it is, who has the authority? You see, brothers and sisters and my friends, we're the, we're the followers. Jesus is the leader. If I, want, if I want to follow Him, He makes the rules. A rich young ruler came up to Jesus and said, Good master, what must I do to inherit heaven, the kingdom of heaven? And of course Jesus said, Thou callest me good. There's none good but the Father. Jesus looked at him, of course, and loved him. He told him what he needed to do. If you want to have what you're asking for, here's the prescription for it. And we know that this rich young ruler went away sorrowfully, for he had many possessions. He was very rich. How sad that is. This rich young ruler recognized Jesus as the Savior and the Lord, but yet refused to follow Him. Isn't it beautiful? Isn't it beautiful the the, the invitation and the command of Jesus is to what we need to do to just simply come after Him. Notice the great invitation in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28. Jesus simply says in that great invitation, come to me. If you're laboring and are heavy laden, come to me. I'll give you rest. He said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am meek and lowly in heart. You shall find rest unto your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Come to me. Learn from me. Follow me. We never have to worry about Jesus leading. He'll do His job. And He'll do it the, the best of any being in the universe. Because He's the greatest leader. But how are we? following to his disciples or those who would be his disciples Jesus just simply said to them follow me some did some didn't isn't it the same today we're going to keep on preaching some will follow some will refuse some will follow now some will follow later. Some will never follow. But I'll go back to Joshua. In Joshua 24 and verse 15. Where he was about to die, he declared to the children of Israel, Choose you this day whom you'll serve. He talked about the gods of their forefathers. Then he talked about the gods of in whose land they dwelt. But then he said, as for me and my house, we will follow, we will serve the Lord. Where do you stand in all of this tonight? Are you a follower of the greatest leader who ever set foot on this old earth? And whoever will? Because if you are, He is the way for you and me, and for all who will follow Him. He's the truth for you and me and all who will follow Him. And He's the life for you and me and all who will follow Him. And where He will lead us is where we need to go, we long to go, we want to go, is all the way to heaven, to the Father's house, where even He is now at the right hand of God preparing a place for us. Are you ready? If, are, you, are you molded by faith? Is your faith founded in Him? 
Have you repented of your sins and confessed His name? Have you been buried with Him in baptism to raise up to walk in newness of life? As a Christian, are you being molded by faith? Are you motivated by your hope? Or have you been distracted? Have you lost sight of where the next step is in following Christ? What moves you? The same thing that I hope it will move you tonight. Maybe down one of these aisles to confess Him and to become His. Christ will lead. Will you follow? I stand ready to help you if you have a need. You can come tonight as we stand together as we sing. Are you searching for answers? Are you looking for truth? Do you need hope in your life? The answers, the truth, and the hope, they're all found here inside God's holy word. God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. The light. Come to know Him. Do His will. Worship Him in spirit and in truth.